about to, we're about to hear some good teaching and preaching, I believe. Amen. Amen. All right, brother. Praise God. sanctuary here, the place where the presence of God is. And, uh, don't ever take that lightly. Amen. 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 Praise God. You know, the only uh, difficult thing about dealing with the subject of prayer is uh, knowing where, which direction to go. I got so much in my heart uh, concerning the subject uh, that it was difficult for me to kind of narrow down which, which direction I needed to go. But uh, I believe what I want to do is I want us to look, begin in uh, Luke uh, chapter 18. I've actually, in, in traveling and preaching and ministering, the Lord has uh, put this, uh, this in my heart, these particular uh, passages that we're going to look at, Luke 18, and then we'll go over to Luke 11. And I'm uh, really dealing with, to start with, uh, we're going to start with tenacity uh, in prayer. Amen. Tenacious, you know, uh, one of the things that we have to uh, understand and recognize as Christians is that we can never lose sight of the reality that, uh, as it concerns prayer, that our prayers matter. Yes. That our prayers matter. Amen. You know, one of the things that the enemy will do, and I've had it happen to myself uh, as well, is he will... Uh, get us into a mentality, a mindset, into thinking that, you know, well, God, since God is sovereign, Amen. that it really doesn't matter whether we pray or not. Wow. Mm -hmm. And God's going to do what he's going to do. And uh, so it doesn't really matter what we do. And I'm just here to tell you that that is a lie from the enemy. Yes, uh, yes God is sovereign, and there are certain things pertaining to, uh, to God's ultimate plan as it regards eschatology. What I'm talking about is the rapture uh, of the church, talking about the second coming of Christ. Now, I don't believe that it matters what we do as it regards that plan of God. God's going to, uh, God is going to call his bride away, his church away. Jesus Christ is coming no matter what we do here on earth. However, as it pertains to the will of God uh, and things happening in our, uh, this dispensation of grace, I guess we could say it that way, as it regards people getting saved, uh, as it regards the move of God, uh, the Spirit of God having liberty uh, to move in our midst, uh, in His church. Um, uh, all of the things that God can do within the confines of a people and the confines of an assembly, our prayers will have great influence regarding those things. Amen. The will of God here on earth, people getting saved, uh, our level of, uh, of maturity and the level of maturity and growth of those whom we uh, are associated with uh, in, in our fellowship and in our churches, uh, our prayers matter. This is, I can just summarize it this way. Our prayers matter as it pertains to the will of God being done and accomplished here in this earth right now in this dispensation of grace that we are living in. Amen. So don't ever let the enemy tell you that your prayers don't matter. In fact, you know, the Bible says that we are uh, laborers with God. Yes. We are laborers with God, and we are co-laborers with the Lord Jesus Christ. That means God has chosen to link arms with you as a believer, one who is born again and hopefully full of God's Spirit. You'll be more effective if you're full of God's Spirit as far as your usefulness. Uh, we have the privilege of being linked together with God to perform His work and His will here in this earth. So think about that. If you could just, you know, dwell on that, meditate on that reality that you are a laborer with God and a co-laborer with the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great uh, responsibility we have. Amen. 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 
Uh, it's a great privilege, but it is also a great responsibility that we have as believers uh, to understand and recognize that God, listen, some of you might, might have a problem with this statement, but God depends upon you to get his will done and things accomplished in this earth. Yes. Right. In this dispensation of grace that we live in. You know, Jesus walked this earth when he did 2,000 plus years ago. Uh, but now we are those who are his hands and his feet and performing the will of God yes. here in this earth. We've got to understand that and we've got to recognize that. Uh, if you don't have that understanding and that realization and that revelation that God chooses, desires to use you and is even... If you can handle it, dependent upon you, not that God isn't sovereign, He is. Yes. Let me just say it this way. He chooses to be dependent upon yes. you yes. to fulfill His will here in this earth. Amen. Yes. And it is a great privilege to be able to be in that position uh, as children of God, to be able to work with God, Amen. to perform His will. And, and prayer is a very important uh, aspect of that. Uh, of that reality that we are joined with him, uh, that we are laborers with him, and, uh, and we must understand that our prayers make a difference. You know, one of the things that I have realized uh, over the years regarding prayer is, yes, prayer does change things. We believe that prayer can change things, amen, according to the will of God. But I think uh, probably just as important and maybe more uh, importantly, prayer changes us. Amen. Uh, prayer, what it does is it aligns us with Him, with God and His will. Yes. We get connected, we get linked up with Him and His will and His plan and His purpose and, and, and what He wants to do here in this earth when we are linked up with Him relationally and walking in intimacy and relationship with Him, that we can fulfill His plan, His purpose, and His will here in this earth in a greater capacity. Praise yes. God. Yes. How many of you believe that the more that we are changed and the more that we are conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more effective we are going to be in this earth as a witness? Amen. Amen. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for people that will link up with Him, be in intimacy and relationship with Him, and be exhibiting the very characteristics and the very life of Christ here in this earth yes. as it is in heaven. Yes. Uh, you have Christ in you, the Bible says, the hope of glory. Amen. Christ lives in you. Amen. In fact, that is really what Christianity is. Yes. You realize that. You know, I think we have a misunderstanding, and, and most Christians don't really recognize and understand really what Christianity is. Christianity isn't you trying to act like Jesus. Come on. It's not you trying to do good things and... You know, uh, what would Jesus do? And then we try to, in our flesh, in our own ability, we try to act that out. Uh, in fact, when you think of that word act, uh, the word hypocrite is what that is. Yes. Hypocrite is a stage actor. Yes. So, so that's not what we are to be or to do as Christians. What we are to do is to submit to what God has given to us in Christ Surrender to His uh, redemption plan and His will and allow Christ to live in us and through us. Yes. And I believe that prayer can help uh, bring that about, that realization and that intimacy and that relationship and the revelation that Jesus wants to live in us and through us. Praise God. So uh, we have to understand that. We have to understand that. And, you know, we, we tend to... Uh, grow weary, you know, we might start out with a bang as far as prayer. Uh, I know this has happened in my own life, that I start out in a season of, of intense prayer uh, and, and being, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm driven to it, I'm motivated in it, and I, I recognize the need, but then as time goes on, 
as time goes on and you don't see the type of, of results and answers as quickly as you would like to see them, what happens is you kind of grow weary. Mm -hmm. And and you kind of let you kind of let let the foot off the gas pedal, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. You kind of you kind of lighten up with it. You just it, it's a subtle thing. It's a it's a gradual thing that happens because as time goes on, you you just grow lethargic and apathetic. So we have to be very aware of that and be very careful that we don't allow that to happen. Amen. And Jesus gave a couple of parables that we're going to look at here. Uh, for a few minutes in Luke 18, and uh, uh, I'll begin reading here in 18 and verse 1. It says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. That word faint means to grow weary. Come on. To grow weary. And like I said, we grow weary when we don't see the results that we like to see in the time frame that we would like to see them. Yeah. God will always answer prayer, but he doesn't answer it in the time frame in which we, we would like to see him answer it. Come on. There are things that you will pray for that you will pray for uh, years and years and years before you may see results. There are some individuals that you may pray for all of your life and their life, and you may not even see the results, salvation or whatever it may be, even in your lifetime. Come on. It may happen after, after you're, after you're gone, after you're in the grave, you may see it. So that's where we have to be tenacious and, yes. and not grow weary and not faint. So men ought always to pray, this is our Lord saying this, and not to faint, saying there was a lady uh, or there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry, notice this, day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. Mm -hmm. So we see in this parable, we see... Uh, a woman who was desperate. She was desperate. She had a desperate need. Whatever that need was, uh, she had a desperate need. She was so desperate that she was crying out to God day and night. How many of us uh, have ever done that to where we are so serious and we want God to do something uh, so, you know, so much and, and so spectacular that we are willing to cry out to him day and night. Mm. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be uh, in your prayer closet day and night, 24 hours a day. But what that means in the prayer closet of your heart, yeah. amen, yeah. in the prayer closet of your heart, you're going to be, there's going to be a cry that you have on a continual basis, a, a prayer that you continually uh, is in your spirit and in uh, your heart. It becomes something that becomes a part of your life. I believe that prayer can be a lifestyle. It's not just a half hour a day, an hour a day. Uh, it's not just, you know, one hour a week if you have a prayer meeting here in the church, and, and you should. Uh, it's not just that, but prayer can become for the born-again, spirit-filled, spirit-controlled believer, prayer can become a lifestyle. Amen. In other words, you walk in a spirit of prayer. Let me just suggest this thought to you. Okay, we have the Holy Spirit within us. So, so the more that the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives, the more that we are living spirit-filled, spirit-controlled lives, 
According to Ephesians 5, 18, Paul said, be being filled with the Spirit, meaning be controlled by the Spirit of God. Amen. So the more the Spirit of God has control in our lives, the more that we are full of the Spirit, the one who is the great intercessor, amen? amen. He's the great intercessor, and he lives in you. Yes. He lives in you. So therefore, the more that we live, I believe, spirit-controlled, spirit-filled lives, and I'm not going to deal with that, but the more that we live that kind of a life, the more that spirit of prayer will be in us. I find the more that I grow in this, the more that I grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, the more the Holy Spirit has control of my life, the more that I am uh, walking and living a spirit-filled life, there is that attitude and that spirit of prayer. Amen. It's just there. Yeah. Amen. Driving down the road, I'm, I'm whatever. You know, I, yes. I uh, many times I'm just trying to watch a football game mm -hmm. or something, and and, uh, uh, and I enjoy watching, you know, a football game. I like to watch certain things, golf matches and things like that. I know it's boring, but I enjoy it. <laughs> and many times I'll, I'll be looking at the TV, but I really, I'm not really watching it. And there's just a, a, a spirit of prayer that just will rise up many times. And, and I'll just begin to pray under my breath or whatever the case may be. Uh, so I think that that is uh, something that we can experience uh, as believers, praying always, all right? Crying to him night and day. So here we have a widow woman. We have an un, unjust judge. This is the parable that Jesus is giving. And let me just say this, if this unjust judge, all right, was willing because of her tenacity, yeah. amen, yeah. continually coming to her yes. to the point where she was wearying him, he said, my goodness, I just want to get her off my back, so I'm going to go ahead and give her what she wants. If he, an unjust judge, was willing to do that, how much more will our Heavenly Father, yes. amen? amen? If we cry to Him day and night, how much more will He, as it says, avenge us speedily? In other words, move on our behalf. And I'm, I'm convinced that that, you know, avenge us speedily. It doesn't mean that God always answers like that, like I said. But when He does decide to answer that prayer, it's speedily. Yeah. Amen. How many of you have prayed for something for years and years, and all of a sudden things just, oh, yeah. boom, yes. it just happens. Amen. There it is. You're like, whoa, where, where'd that come from? You know, yeah, you've been praying for it. You've been crying out to God for it, but God did it speedily. So we have to have uh, that confidence and that assurance within our hearts, knowing, all right, knowing that the God of the universe, the one who loves us, the one who committed himself to us, the one who sent his son uh, to die for us, uh, how he longs to do things on our behalf that pertain to his will, his plan, and his purpose. Yes. Amen? Amen. And that's the key right there. His will, his plan, and his purpose. Yes. Now, many times we pray for things that are not according to his will, his plan and his purpose. We as James said, James said that, you know, you, you ask amiss, yeah. meaning you're asking God for things that you may consume it upon your own lust. Mm. We have to realize that this thing about the kingdom of God and, and us as Christians is not about us. Yes. It's not even about our comfort, our, you know, uh, you know, a lot of money and then big Come houses on. and big cars and, and things that this, you know, things in this world, extravagant things that, that has nothing to do with that stuff. Yes. And I'm not saying that, that God doesn't bless us and God many times will give us something above and beyond and even nicer than we really need or deserve, but that's his doing. Mm. We have to get to the place to where we want the will of God, we want God to have His way, we want Christ to be glorified uh, in us, we want Christ to be glorified in His church, uh, we want the will of God. Yes. 
We want, and we'll look at it in Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew 6 here, we want the kingdom of God. We want the things that are pertaining to the Lord. So a lot of times Christians will be asking God for things that aren't even his will, and God's not even really paying any attention to that. He's not even hearing that. And then what happens is we get discouraged because God is not answering our carnal prayer, our carnal selfish prayer. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we get discouraged and, well, I'm just not going to pray anymore because God doesn't hear me. Well, try praying according to the will of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try praying for the things that pertain to the kingdom of God and, and Christ and what he is desiring to do in us, in his church, and through us. If you pray that way, God will answer every time. So that's key. Yeah. Yes. We have got to pray according to the will of God. That's why it's important that you know the Word of God. You've got to find out what God's will is. Yeah. Amen. You know, I mean, we know that it's God's will that people be saved. Yes. So that's a good thing to pray for. Yeah. We know that it's God's will that uh, believers be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We know that it's God's will that Christians be uh, conformed into the image of Christ. Yes. Uh, we know that it's God's will that... Uh, Jesus Christ would, would reign in the hearts uh, of his people. All of these things are really what we should be praying for as believers. God, I want more of your spirit in my life. That's a good prayer to pray. Yes. Amen? Amen? God, we want more of the Holy Spirit to be manifest here in our midst. We want more of Christ to be revealed. Yes. Uh, I think of Paul, you know. How many know that Paul probably prayed according to the will of God? Amen. Amen. Uh, all of the prayers that he prayed for the particular churches, the two uh, particular prayers in the book of Ephesians uh, in chapter 1 and in chapter 3. And then there's another prayer that he prayed for the believers in Colossae. There's a couple prayers, I think, in 1 Thessalonians, one in Philippians. Prayers that have any substance to them, but... You know, every, in every one of those prayers, when you really dig into them and what he prayed for those people, you know what he prayed for? That they would have a greater revelation of the new covenant. Yes. He prayed that they would have a greater revelation of Calvary. Yes. He prayed that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. Their eyes, spiritual eyes, would be open, that they would know what is the hope of His calling. Yes. And the glorious riches of the inheritance in the saints and the power to us word who yes. believe. All of that that He was praying, you could summarize it as a greater revelation of Calvary. Yes. Yes, Lord. I mean, no, that's really what we need. Yes. yes. That's the greatest prayer you can pray for yourself. For your fellow believers, for your pastor. So when he gets in the pulpit and he preaches, he's preaching a deeper revelation of the new covenant. Yes. That's what this thing is all about. It's all about the new covenant. It's all about us understanding and having a revelation of it and walking in it. Lord, yes. open up our eyes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Open up the eyes of our heart. Open up the eyes of our understanding. Grant unto us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Son of the living God. You can look at that in Ephesians chapter 1. I'd encourage you to read it. And then in chapter 3, we also pray basically a similar prayer. That they, they would know the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And they would know the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Meaning that they would understand Calvary in a greater capacity. Yes. Yes. That the people of God would walk in the fullness of Christ. Mm. You see, that's the heart. If, if, if the Holy Spirit deemed it important, all right, or let me say it this way. He must have deemed it of utmost importance if he gave that to the Apostle Paul and he put it in his word. Yes. He must have deemed that as great importance as far as what the will of God is for you. Mm. Yes. That you would know the breadth, that you would know the length, that you would know the height, that you would know the depth 
the love of God that is in Christ. What he's talking about is Calvary, what Jesus did on the cross. That your eyes would be open to it in a greater capacity so that you could walk in the fullness of Christ. Amen. So good. So point being this, we have to ask for the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. This ain't about you. Amen. Christianity ain't about you. It ain't all about your blessing. And yeah, God does bless. Don't get me wrong. You'll live the most blessed life if you really seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yes. The Bible says that he'll add everything unto you that you need. Yes. We just got to get our priorities right. Start seeking the kingdom, the rule, the reign, the dominion of Christ yes. in our hearts and in our lives. And he'll add all these other things. See, we're seeking the things. Yeah. And we're forgetting about the most important thing. Seeking him and his kingdom and his will and his plan and his purpose. And he's saying, man, if you would just get it right and start seeking me and my kingdom and what I can do, I'll give you all that other stuff. Yeah. If you're called to pastor or called to be involved in ministry or whatever it may be, God will open that door. He'll give it. You don't have to uh, beg him for that. He'll give it to you. Amen. You get it right. You get your priorities right. Oh, and you start seeking first the kingdom of God. Amen. So she cried day and night. And as a result of her tenacity, tenacity, she we need, to, we need to start wearying God. <laughs> we need to start, you know, bombarding heaven and asking God for, for, for the things pertaining to the kingdom of God so much. And he says, man, I, these, these people are bugging me today. <laughs> I better go ahead and move. I better go ahead and do something. Do what they're, do what they're asking me to do. <clears throat> so we need to be tenacious, amen, like this, this widow. I will avenge her, lest by her continue with coming, she weary me. This uh, last verse that we looked at here in, in verse 8, he says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. Now let's look at that for a moment. We see here that prayer and faith, there is a correlation. When Jesus comes back to this earth, or what, what he's looking for, as an exhibition of faith is a praying people. Mm. You see, faith and prayer go hand in hand. Yeah. People that don't pray are faithless people. Mm. People that pray are people of faith. It takes faith to pray, folks. Amen. It takes great faith to pray according to the will of God, according to what God wants, not what we want, what He wants. It takes greater faith to pray according to the will of God. So there is a correlation here. When Jesus comes back to the earth, will he find faith on earth? It's no accident that it's in the context of this parable on prayer. An evidence of someone who is really full of faith, walking by biblical faith, the faith of the Son of God, according to the gospel, the earmark of that is a people who pray. Yeah. If, if you're bragging and boasting about your great faith, I want to see what kind of prayer life you have. Come on. That's good. Because great faith is going to produce a powerful, a, a tenacious uh, prayer life. Amen. So that's one way we can examine ourselves, you know. Don't be so proud of our, or be too quick to boast of, of, of our great faith when we don't have a prayer life. Because they go hand in hand, as we see here. When he comes back to the earth, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith like this, this widow woman who was crying out to God day and night? Will he find that? Will he find a people that are uh, crying out to him and seeking him and, and, and desiring him and desiring his will? Will he find that? Is he, when he looks at us, what does he see? Does he see a people of faith who are living a lifestyle of prayer, who are crying out to him day and night, God, I want you to move. God, I want you to move in me. God, I want you to move in my family. God, I want you to move in my church. Yes. Well, there's plenty to pray for, folks. If we're not praying, that means that we're unaware of what uh, God desires and what God wants to do. Uh, he wants to do so much. But did you ever think about this? 
that when we don't pray, when we don't uh, submit to God's will, God's way, and, and then pray, God's hands are tied. God will only be able to do so much when his people don't pray. Going back to the statement I made earlier that you are a laborer with God, a co-laborer with Christ. You've got to get that in your spirit. You've got to have a revelation of that. You have realization uh, that, man, what I, uh, my level of prayer and my prayer life and my submission to uh, the new covenant and, and living a spirit-filled life, uh, it has everything to do with the will of God being fulfilled here in this earth, here and now. Do we realize that? Do we understand that? That's how important that it is. Don't let the devil tell you, well, it doesn't really matter. God's sovereign. He's just going to do what he's going to do. You know? It's like when it comes to election time. Well, it doesn't matter if I vote. You know, God's going to do what he's going to do. I used to fall into that category. Uh, we have the right to do that. We, we've been given that right to be involved in that process, all right? Uh, and along with praying and, and, and voting, we can actually redirect the direction and the affairs of our nation, mm, that's amen? Right. That's right. We can do that. Uh, we have that, that responsibility. So I'm just trying to get, the, uh, get this, uh, this reality, get you to understand this and, and and really let it sink in that it matters. Your prayers matter. Yes. God uses them. God will uh, move. God will change you. God will change your family. God will change your church. Uh, we have to be a people of prayer. I want to look at uh, a few pages back, Luke chapter 11. I figured we'd go for a few more minutes, take a little break. I don't want to keep you here for a full two hours. Take a little break, and then uh, then we'll, we'll meet back up. Let me just let me at least just introduce this, and then we'll we'll take a break. In Luke chapter eleven, Bible says, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Notice he didn't say teach us to preach, <laughs> teach us to sing, teach us to start great big ministries, you know. Uh, no, he said, Lord, teach us to pray. Yeah. You see, if we learn to pray and we get in the right relationship with God and we ask God to move, then all those other things will fall into place. Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, it's interesting here. I don't know if you ever noticed this, but this is the same, uh, uh, the, the, what Jesus is going to say regarding the model prayer, the prayer pattern, the Lord's prayer. Uh, it's the same one in Matthew chapter 6. It's interesting that in Matthew chapter 6, it was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. All right? It was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he taught them the Lord's Prayer. So here we are about two, two and a half years later, and Jesus already taught the disciples this prayer pattern, so why are they asking him again? Let me just submit a couple of thoughts to you. One being that either they forgot... They just forgot about it. It didn't, it didn't sink in. It, didn't, it wasn't a revelation to them, and they never used it, and it didn't sink in. Or they used it for a while, and because they didn't get the immediate results yeah. or the results that they thought they should get, they just kind of let it go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Jesus just repeats the same thing he repeated two and a half years ago. All right? He said unto them, when you pray, say our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven and uh, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is not shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his what? Importunity. Yeah. 
Same thing that we saw in Luke chapter 18. Because of his uh, importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. And say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. So here we have, the Lord is telling us to importune, to be tenacious, to ask. The idea is to ask and to keep on asking. The idea is to knock and to keep on knocking. Not just one time, but keep on knocking. Uh, seek and keep on seeking. Amen? So ask, seek, knock. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking on that door. And again, and for the sake of continually coming to him for importunity, uh, the Lord will give us what we need. Amen. Notice he said not because he's his friend. It's not good enough just to be a friend. Amen. I mean, we're a friend of God. Amen. Amen. I think what God is saying is not good enough just to be my friend. Do you believe that? The Bible says that we are not just servants, but we're friends. Yes. Amen. Amen. So it's, that's not good enough. We have to be tenacious. We have to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking until that door is open unto us. Amen? Amen. All right. For everyone that asks receives, he that seeks finds, and him that knocks it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? I want you to notice something here. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the what? The Holy Spirit to them that ask him. So here again we see, and I just want to emphasize this, and I'll let you all take a break, that asking things that are pertaining to the will of God. Notice he's, he, the idea is not asking, seeking, and knocking for things to fulfill our lusts and our desires. Asking for more of the Holy Spirit, that is something that God wants us to pray for and ask for. Amen? Amen. That's where our hearts really ought to be. God, we want more of your Spirit. Yeah. How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? More so than an earthly parent, all right? God Almighty will give things pertaining to His will, His plan, and His purpose, and give the Spirit to those who ask Him. May, amen. You say, well, brother, I'm already, I'm already born again. I'm already baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know what? You need more of the control yes. of God's Spirit. Come on. Yes. You need less of us, less of me, and more of Him. Yes. Amen? amen? So, <laughs> again, you know, we... we in, a, in America especially, all right, the church really worldwide, but especially in America, we have so, uh, and this is probably not a word, but we have carnalized the gospel. Come on. In other words, for it to, it's for us, for our, you know, our satisfaction, for our glory, for, you know, our blessing. And again, don't get me wrong. God is a blessing God. He will bless you. But you know what you really exist for? You exist for the glory of God. Yes. Right. Amen. Amen. You exist for the glory of God. You know, I think of Solomon, the wisest man in the world, at the end of his, in, of his life, if you read it in Ecclesiastes, I mean, he had all the money that a person could want. He had the prominence, the position, the power. He had relationships, 900 and some wives and concubines. I mean, he had everything that a human being on this earth could possibly have to satisfy their flesh, their desire. And you know what he said? I finally realized, this is my paraphrase, I finally realized that the whole duty of man is simply this, to fear God. And he said, keep his commandments, meaning to obey him. That's what you exist for. That's what you're here for. Do you understand that? You're not here to make money. You're not here to be successful. 
And some of you will be. You'll make money and you'll be successful. That'll just be part of it. But that's not really what you exist for. You don't exist just to be a good mother, good father, good pastor. You exist to glorify God, to fear Him, to obey Him, and allow Him to have His way in your life. You know how God is glorified in this earth? He's glorified in this earth when you allow Christ to live in you and through you. Yes. That's how God is glorified in this earth. When your light so shines all of the time, everywhere you go, you walk in the glory of God. You walk in the presence of God. That is the greatest testimony in this earth that there is. Amen. Witnessing is not just going on a street corner and handing out tracts, my friend. Witnessing is what you do when you're in your home. Amen. With your family. Witnessing is what you do when you're on your job. Just and, and, and you may need you may not open your mouth. Come on. And you're witnessing yeah, that's right. by the life of Christ that you are living. That's right. And then as the opportunity comes, when the Holy Spirit opens the door, yes, then you open your mouth. And you explain to that individual who is looking, searching, hungry. You explain to them the way of salvation. Many times, if you're really walking in the power of God, the presence of God, and walking in His Spirit, people will just they'll recognize something different about you. And they'll, if, they're, if they're hungry, they're going to eventually come to you and say, Hey, what's going on, man? There's just something different about you. And then you have the opportunity, that's the open door, for you to explain to them the gospel. <laughs> but we have to realize that's what we live for, folks. This thing ain't all about us. Amen. I'm afraid in our country that we have just, we're so selfish, we're a, we're a consumer people. We use God. Come on. Yes. We use God for our own consumption. We use them just for our selfish gratification. He makes us feel better. He gives me joy. He gives me peace. And He will. He does. But you exist to glorify God. Yeah. And you say, well, what, why are you talking about that? Why are you dealing with well, that? Well, that will change your prayer, the focus of your prayer in your prayer life. Mm -hmm. Your prayers will no longer be selfish prayers. Right. You know, God, I want a relationship, you know, for me. And there's nothing wrong with desiring that. I want you to say, God, I want the relationship that you have for me. Yeah. Yes. I want that which is going to glorify you. Yes. So praying according to the will of God. So we're going to take a break, and then we're going to look at uh, the prayer pattern of Jesus for a few moments here tonight. And this prayer pattern will help us to pray according to the will of God. Thank you, God. So let's take a break for a few minutes.